if you're surrounded by nature and you're surrounded by greenery and you have like regular contact, that you behave more environmentally friendly. Welcome to the Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode. Ross here. The sound you're hearing underneath is just a recording from my travels in Italy this summer. Um, these are actually some street musicians in Turin doing some African drumming. And uh, for some reason, it seems like this is a good um, sort of introduction sound for the topic that we're talking about today, which is biophilic design. My guest today is Vanessa Champion, who is the editor of the Journal of Biophilic Design, which is a fantastic podcast of the same name, and soon to be a magazine, which is coming out first, its first issue in November, which I'm contributing an article to, so hopefully you can check that out uh, when it does go live. Um, But today we're talking all about uh, the ger- uh, talking all about biophilic design and what that means in its various forms with a focus on uh, applications of biophilia and design in the built environments so or architecture and urban design um, and also looking at how biophilic design and climate action uh, work really really well together and are really really close allies that should be thought of as as working really closely together it's a fantastic conversation um, Vanessa just has so much knowledge and passion for this subject and you really hear it um, uh, as she's talking about these things um, I had an absolute you know, fantastic time recording this with her um, the other thing is that right before we recorded this interview she recorded an interview with me for her podcast The Journal of Bioflick Design which is out now so if you want to go uh, and have a listen to that and we talk about things like climate adaptation and the primal city concept um, that I've talked about previously on this podcast. If you don't want to hear more of me talking, definitely go and check out the other guests that she has had on because it's a fantastic and fascinating array of people from topics like climate action through to things like landscape design and interior design, uh, etc. So covering a really broad range um, of biophilic design. If you're enjoying this episode and if you're enjoying the podcast in general, the best thing you can do to support it is to share it share an episode with a friend or a colleague who you think will enjoy it um, or share it on social media Uh, word of mouth is the best way um, of spreading these conversations you can also reach out to myself um, via the links in the description you can send me a message via my website which is greenurbanistpod.com okay enjoy the episode Thank you so much, Vanessa, for joining me. Um, can you please introduce yourself and just tell us a bit about who you are and what you do? Lovely. Thank you, Ross. Thanks for having me on your fantastic podcast. Um, really, really cool. Um, well, I'm, I'm editor of uh, the Journal of Biophilic Design. Um, I started off life actually as an academic. I've had such a bonkers life. Uh, you couldn't <laughs> make it up. It really is. The journey has been really weird and, and, and wonderful, too. Um, probably saying yes more than I should have done but no, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably made it it's probably what's made it good um yeah I started off as an academic at UCL in in Greek and Latin can you believe wow. I went to, yeah I went to the British Museum um but I was always fascinated about how our environment and obviously how the ancient you know world how their built environment really affected them wow. um particularly interested in healing centers ancient healing centers like the Esclepion um which was a place where people would go and and heal in in nature actually you know kind of open plan sort of where they would listen to bird song and and the water going past and so i kind of had an introduction to how how architecture and how landscaping could really affect healing um and, and our mindset and our well-being and our flourishing um personally but when i was about 20 i started living in incre- you know naturally um if you want like you know proper food you know whole food so anything that had been mixed up and put in a packet i wouldn't eat <laughs> um you know walking lots and and just and wearing natural material clothing and having plants around me and wood grain and just just getting rid of plastic was yeah. one of my main things and 
Wow. And, and I'm a photographer and a filmmaker. So um, I started selling landscape photography when I was 16 before that. So all these threads started to come in together. Uh, and when I um, when I finished my PhD, I was I was doing a bit of photography and, and journalism for the university. Um, and I and I sort of went into editorial and PR and marketing, worked for the ITV and BBC and stuff. So I ended up doing this sort of media thing. And I realized that the power of the power of media to be able to um influence and just change minds, inspire people to maybe have a different way of being. And I thought, you know, we're using it like for the wrong reasons. We're using it to make people get fat by eating ready meals and all this kind of stuff. And yeah. and why? How how about using media to to make lives better? So everything has kind of come full circle. I'm I'm now a lot older than I was when I kind of had that initial thought. And um, with all the experience and everything, I've I'm it's where I'm doing now. So that's why I've I'm sort of launched the Journal of Biophilic Design. Um, both my parents had been in hospital and I realized that this thing called biophilic design, this Mm -hmm. whole thing about connecting people to views of nature would help heal them. Yeah. I couldn't do anything about my father because he was looking at ceiling tiles. Um, unfortunately, so he spent his last days, he had Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. So he come, he had nowhere to, no frame of reference if you want. So it must, I can't even begin to imagine what a nightmare that must've been for him, um, mentally and emotionally. But my mother, um, who was in an isolation unit thing, and I, I took her images of nature in the like, beautiful oh, blue wow. scenes and, and views of nature. And she's like, her mind, you know, her blood pressure came down, wow. her delirium, you know, went away, and she started coming too, and she became, became my mother again. And that's when I thought, like, just like you were saying, actually, Ross, you know how um, you, I, I don't, I don't proclaim to know everything about this thing. That's, that's why I set this podcast up. It's because I wanted to share the knowledge that I was learning. It went, I just didn't want to keep it in my back pocket and go, Oh, look, I know all this stuff. It's <laughs> like, oh, you know, I want to know, I want to tell everybody about it. So, so that's kind of, that's kind of where I am really with it, with it all. And, and we're launching the magazine in October, um, which is going to be a, an online and printed magazine. So sort of building on the podcast that we've got, we're, um, we're doing the sort of, um, uh, crazy eight page, eighty page uh, mm. magazine full of um, stuff about cities and homes and healthcare and workplaces and sharing research and stuff. So, yeah, that, that's going to be good. So, um, I, you're going to be in it, Ross. So I'm going to make sure you're there. <laughs> <laughs> I've talked talked my way into it somehow. Um, thank you for th- thank you for that fantastic intro. I mean, that's such a profound story, and I think you know, I think that sets us up for a conversation of talking about just how important. Um, having access to nature is amazingly, even if it's just a picture of nature or a painting of it, um, still has an effect on us. Um, for people who are maybe a bit new to the topic, can you tell us, you know, what is biophilic design and why, I suppose, can maybe some examples of it um, and why it's important? How do you apply it in the world, I guess? Yeah, no, cool. Um, well, it was in 1960, <laughs> excuse me, in 1960, a guy called Eric Fromm, um, he wrote a thing called the a heart of man and he mentioned this the biophilia concept it was then picked up by um eo wilson um later in 1980s and um biophilia is is like is is our inherent need to connect to nature so philia meaning love and liking and bio meaning living thing like we have biology life um and it's, it's more than just um our natural world it's also about animal you know it's not just not just about plants and trees it's about animals and life in general mm. um i mean we you know proto-humans you know right up to the you know not so long ago um we were living outside and and sort of the ancient world you know you've got the healing centers there's so many different connections to nature that we've done and it was really sort of really from i suppose from the industrial revolution particularly in the west where we've um squished ourselves into boxes white walls um and we've made factories of our interiors whether that's the workplace or whether it's our healthcare systems and our education systems, they're just functional boxes. Mm. And we're getting, we're getting sick We're our blood pressures are high. You know, our stress levels are really high <clears throat> and biophilic design is, is the design principle um, of using bi- the biophilia effect, if you want, in the built environment um and um and that's really it it's like just a, that fundamental need within us to connect to the natural world and to be surrounded by by nature we need a direct 
physical contact with nature. You know, so it all comes in like, you know, sort of three packages, if you want. <laughs> so one is the direct connection with nature. Um, mm. And that's, you know, like I've got here, like plants and, and sort of wood and, you know, hearing birdsong and listening to water and seeing water and feeling and touching water and feeling the breath of fresh air and all those natural, um, you know, direct contacts. The second one is like the patterns of nature. So oh. that's textures. So and also shapes and curves. So if you think nature doesn't have straight lines, yeah. so um, we don't really want to build and and sort of construct with straight lines. We want rounded edges and curves. And also, um, if you think about it in nature, we've got things called uh, sort of like you know prospects and refuge where we can look out and go through. We want intrigue. We don't want just a straight corridor. Yeah. You know, if we can, we can design with a curve so it leads us around and our brains need that stimulus our brains need to um connect with that um, mystery um if you want as well and the sort of third thing really is that the rhythms of nature so that there's a whole circadian the whole circadian rhythm of of you know of knowing that it's nighttime and we do something different there maybe we light a fire and then, then mm. during the day we kind of like you know we we have our day-to-day -day thing but then in the morning you know we wake up and there's as you mentioned there's bird song and um you know and that and that and sunrise which is wonderful um the singapore airport he's mentioned about can you mention an example oh my word <laughs> i haven't been there yet because obviously we're not allowed to travel or anything but if people want to google singapore airport um it's beautiful it's like optimum interior um design bringing all the elements of biophilic design in there um it's just it's a waterfall there's trees mm. and plants the the rail link that goes through the airport um is surrounded by trees and bushes it's it's basically like a city in a jungle mm. um it's just wonderful um it's so uplifting and fantastic um another example would be the roof in the british museum so people listen oh, to this yeah. in the uk or may have been to the british museum and you look up and you have all the natural light um around what used to be the old north library um and it's, there's a crisscross pattern as well, which also gives us that whole thing of like looking through branches and, and mm. things. So it's that mimic of nature. So this is biomimicry. This is like bringing in a mimic, mimicry of nature. Um, so, um, yeah, that's kind of an, and we, we need it because it, you know, for our wellness and our creativity and to support the environment and helps us meet net zero. And I just, it's, there are so many, so many reasons. Um, I mean, I've actually got some fact, facts and figures here, for instance, um, you know, there's it improves concentration. It's up to 15% increase in productivity, um, lower blood pressure. You need 22% less medication, you know, wow. if you're in hospital, you know, 8.5% shorter hospital stays. I mean, it's, there's so much research um, mm. that I, that I, again, that I touch on in the Journal of Biophilic Design, but um, yeah, there's just, um, yeah, it was crazy not to, not to bring it in and, um, yeah, and and the whole environmental message as well. The whole, the, just the very nature of biophilic design is sustainable, um, using more, you know, natural woods and mm. and and having airflow and things too. So yeah, anyway, but I could go on and on and on. It's just like it's such a good thing. <laughs> so. It's 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 a real like mega concept, isn't it? Because it's once you understand it, you realize it's applicable to everything. You know, and a couple yeah. of the examples you use there are like healthcare and mm. interior design and yeah. you know architecture um yeah. and you know it, it even education i mean i think there's been some work done around um having more biophilic schooling and having things like forest schools um yeah. or even just having better outdoor spaces um that are more naturalistic and bringing more sort of unstructured uh, exploration of nature into school curricula is um, is really good for children and so it's sort of like it, you can really just apply it to anywhere whatever you know wherever whatever walk of life you come from there's a biophilic uh, aspect to it that is really important yeah absolutely um there's a there's a great book written by the terrapin bright green um it's a research report but they talk about the actually economic benefits of oh, biophilic yeah, yeah. design as well which um so if anybody's listening to this with a with purse strings in mind um <laughs> There, there are shed loads because if you introduce um, biophilic elements, you've got this beautiful natural environment with plants and trees and and lights and big windows and and but you know obviously with, with shading and stuff. 
um, but it puts the price of your property up. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like this. There is there are even to that degree. If people are kind of going to be that shallow and just worry about the, <laughs> but, you know, worry about the bottom line rather than doing the right thing, then it then it, it puts it puts you know puts money in your in your in your investment. So um, <sighs> and of course as well, it, it reduces absenteeism. So if you're in the workplace, if you're an office um, manager you're a director of a company and your your staff are always sitting there or, or going off sick or just sitting there twiddling their thumbs and pretending to be productive um it actually reduces that as well because it helps them get on with the job and enjoy their workplace so they're not just um just playing lip service to just you know just being present as it were yeah. so um um i think there's a 33 percent reduction as well and like you know on recruitment costs because you don't need to keep wow. recruiting because people are going to want to stay there, um, you know. And if you, especially if you're trying to, inc- you know, recruit Generation Z or whichever whichever one we're in at the minute, <laughs> <laughs> um, but they, they want to work. I mean, they've done studies on that as well. There's research to know that they only want to work in companies that um, care about the environment for a start, um, but also they're beautiful places to work. Yeah. So if they care for their if they care for the workplace, they're going to work care, care for the workforce. So there's also that subliminal messaging that's going on. So yeah, it's, yeah, I think that's I think that's fantastic. I mean, I think so many of the environments we inhabit on a day to day basic are, basis are just so unnatural. I mean, enough many yeah. like open plan office environments. There's so many things there that are kind of pushing at your evolutionary buttons of just like excess noise. People yeah. are behind you. You can't see them. You know, you're having to sort of focus on one thing, get rid of distractions. You're in an environment that is probably grey and and is not, you know, very, has a lot of straight lines and is very functional. And, you know, we're sort of, we sort of put people in them and sort of expect them just to be at their best. <laughs> but we're making it so yeah. difficult for them. Yeah, exactly. And I, sort of, I work with um, Dr. Sally Augustine, and she's an environmental psychologist, you know, she's like a researcher and, and sort of um, advocate for all this. But um, she talks about, um, you talk about sitting on a seat, you know, with something with, you know, there's all this noise and everything behind you. And she always talks about a chipmunk. She says, <laughs> Would a chipmunk be comfortable sitting on that seat <laughs> with all the stuff behind it? And it's kind of like a baseline. It's like, no, actually, a chipmunk wouldn't be happy being in a really noisy environment and everything else. So why would you get what if you, you wouldn't do it to a chipmunk? You wouldn't do it to yourself, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's interesting. But, yeah. <laughs> Let, let's talk about the, I suppose, the intersection of biophilic design with climate change as well. It's yeah. obviously the focus of my my podcast. Um is there a role to be played, do you think, for biophilic design? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we, we, we spoke earlier about um, how bringing in that more trees and plants and greening, um, obviously a key aspect of biophilic design um, and waterscapes will um, support the climate mm. um, agenda in the built environment. So obviously everything from reducing temperatures to actually also creating a psychological nudge to the people using that space. So whether that's in a workplace, whether it's in a school, whether it's anywhere else, um, and especially in, in, in the built environment, it, it we know we've done, again, there've been done studies and research to know that if you're surrounded by nature and you're surrounded by greenery and you have like regular contact, mm. um, you know, like so much percent of the day, particularly that you behave more environmentally friendly oh wow so actually there's a benefit of having more biophilic design everywhere because then we will we will by default behave more sensitive to the climate uh, to the uh, environment so we won't for instance go and use go and buy a big plastic breakfast and and you know <laughs> plastic and polystyrene and plastic forks chuck away things we go like, actually no we won't do that mm. we'll choose the shop that sells it with the paper and everything else it's like we make different choices so for me and and i and even when i started this thing i just i i've not made it you know i'm not i'm not trying to hide it i think it's a <laughs> i want people to be surrounded by nature so that they behave more mm. sensitively um to our beautiful planet that we're on um I, I think that's really good plants as well reduce uh the vocs you know the pollutants um in our in our in our homes in our workplaces and you think about our paints they give off gas yeah. um all our appliances everything gives off gas um we buy furniture that's got formaldehyde that's kind of you know there's different plants you know peace lilies and you know sansevieras they, they, they really absorb plant uh, the vocs really well so 
I know I'm going on about plants quite a bit here, but that's a really good thing. Another thing, actually, which is really interesting, is that um, if you can if you can bring in more natural light and more um, natural airflow, obviously you'll need less electronics. Um, you know, you need less right. electricity. You won't need as much lighting, actually. You know, to put the switch, flick the switch for the lights, because you'll have as much light as you can mm. coming in through the, the window. And also, you won't need so much aircon because, so long as there's no pollutants outside, you're not on a main road, of course, because otherwise you'd be gassing your people. <laughs> um, but you know, if you're if you're relatively off the back street, it's not you know it's it's okay. Um, but yeah, you just open open your door, open your windows, um, which is better for the sound as well. You know, um, the said Paige Hodsman of Ecofon, she mentions that um, it's really good. You know, to just open the window. It's one of the best forms yeah. of reduction of like reverb and um, that you can have in a in a in a in a, in a built environment um so yeah i mean they're just they're just two things really um but um obviously planting more trees and things reduces the runoff like we mentioned before it's like it's just so many so many things really so yeah we need just for those two fundamental reasons i think we need more biophilic design just so it nudges us yeah. to, to behave more sensitively so. it, it is actually amazing when you start to think about how much overlap there is i, I was just spoke to um, an architect and an engineer on a previous episode which was um, Amin Taha and Steve Webb um, Mm. who uh, are both really pushing that we need to start building again using stone as a building material Um, Uh, and so we a lot of the the old vernacular architecture would have just used stone because it's locally available you can find it everywhere um and it's incredibly hard wearing will literally last millions of years and um you know what they're saying is actually when you run the calculations it's also far far more sustainable and he gave me the example of like stone um is extremely uh it's extremely strong and so you can use it as a structural element and you need a lot less of it compared to concrete um and so they said you know if you compare a building with a concrete structure or with a stone structure um, you use a lot less material and that takes down mm-hmm. all of the, first of all, the, the you know, you don't have any of the manufacturing. The stone is just the stone. You quarry it, you cut it out and it stays intact. But for um, concrete, there's all these chemical and industrial processes you have to go through that are all fueled by fossil fossil fuels. Um, but then in the transportation, it's, you cut down the transportation much less um, and all this kind of thing. Uh, it's the same for timber, you know, building with timber. It's fantastic to be in a building that has you know timber features um it's really really nice and if if you can source it from well-managed forests that can start to become a carbon sink as well as long as you're you're planting more uh, uh, you're regenerating it as a, at a faster rate than you're, you're harvesting it uh, and so they were very very you know they had a lot of uh, very convincing facts and numbers behind it um that i i, I don't have access to right now but um i think that's a, a really interesting aspect of it as well is get away i mean we've been building with glass and steel so much and i'm looking out towards the city of london here from my window um but it's not we don't really connect to it as humans it's it's a bit cold and corporate and sort of clinical uh but things like stone um and timber and that kind of thing and even um you know we could even go further and we can say what about rammed earth or building with hemp um and things like that which which are are you know you you can build with um Mm -hmm. very effectively uh, we, I think it's much easier to ke- create a sort of sort of connection to it as an animal. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. There's a thing called hempcrete, isn't there? Mm. Where they're doing the kind of building with that. So, um, yeah, and using, like you say, the vernacular. I've, I've worked in Africa and India and, and different places, and you kind of when you go off piece, if you kind of go off the main, you know, just just it's it's a wonderful experience to be living in the earth with the earth um yeah. and connected to the earth uh, obviously the rest of their lives are very hard um people that i've been documenting i would say with photo aid mm. um but um yeah it's um it's, it's one it's really wonderful you know i was, I was there once with, with this like nomadic um this sort of pastoralist people and they it was absolutely chucking it down with rain i mean like like no like there was no tomorrow we're, we're in a mud we're in a mud hut with a thatched roof and, you know, I mean, you can't get more organic than that and more <laughs> biophilic. And we're sitting on cow hides. You know, there's no, there is nothing that's made in like, you know, a kind of high street store. It's all, it's all made um, locally. <laughs> 
And, you know, and it was wonderful. Um, wooden door was blowing slightly in the wind. Obviously, it was really hot there. So the, it was just, it was creating, there's just this little tiny wooden door moving really slowly, <laughs> was creating natural ventilation. Oh, wow. There were, must have been about 20 of us, 30 of us sitting in this, squished in this little tiny thing. And it was wonderful. It was, it was wow. cool inside. And because it's so, the way it's done, it was so, and there was no rain. No rain, no rain came in. We didn't get wet. Amazing. You know, it's kind of, <laughs> so uh, anyway. Yeah, we have, I mean, you still find thatched roofs in Ireland as well on some very old yeah. buildings there. That's a, you know, a normal uh, yeah. vernacular architecture there as well. So yeah, we, exactly. can, we can think about bringing these things back. And also, I think something that's really interesting with uh, building with natural materials is actually, I mean, we, maybe there's two sides to this argument. We we tend to think about architecture as being very permanent, you know, we're going to build it and it's going to stand there for all time. Of course, we know that doesn't happen. Usually buildings last about 60 years and then they get, you know, demolished and rebuilt or, or you know, whatever, re- at the very least retrofitted and changed and modified. Um, sort of vernacular architecture takes that time scale much shorter and you build something with, uh, with you know, you and a couple of your uh, friends or your tribe you build it with your hands and it might stay there for a year or two. Uh, mm. And then at some point you have to rebuild it or maybe you move on camp and you build it somewhere else. And then that sort of just falls back into the, you know, falls back into the natural cycle. Um, that's something we don't do at all in cities. And uh, there's lots of practical reasons for that, but it's a really interesting thought of like a biophilic sense. Like what if you had a house that only lasted five years and then, yeah. you know, you, you, you got to modify it and sort of replenish it and using natural materials and everything. I don't know. It's just an interesting thought. It is. It's a wonderful idea, really, because yeah. then, you know, we all get bored. <laughs> <laughs> and then if we combine it with a bit of stone, you know, hey, you could sort of like, and then you could, the bit that you didn't, you didn't mind remodeling, you know, even if you want to have like compromise, so you have like your stone built house that you can invest in and you could build. And then the bits where you kind of think, oh, actually, I want to have a studio now. And actually, no, I want to do this now. I want an outdoor environment. I want to, you know, and then yeah. you can, when you, when you sell your house someone else can knock that down or it just falls down naturally (laughs) Um, and then it becomes something else you know yeah it's great organic we'll go back to the earth we are we are from the earth and we'll end up in the earth so actually yeah why not it's a nice idea um you've already told us you've already given us you know um some really good examples of bringing a biophilic design into the built environment Mm -hmm. um what are some things i suppose that maybe from people you've talked to on your podcast that are really exciting you in terms of biophilic design in, in any domain, really. So I think it's yeah. all so interesting. Well, I, I mean, just keeping on the cities thing, I interviewed uh, Robert Bedner um, and we're talking about green roofs and living, living, living walls and mm. living roofs and, and, and also urban farming. I've interviewed different people with different, you oh, know, yeah. who are interested in that. And I think going back to how each of us as an individual, um, you know, many drops, become a big ocean if you know what I mean I think we can all do something locally we can all do something in our backyard I interviewed Chris Packham for instance and he was saying look you know if you do anything you know put some bird boxes up put some bat boxes up you know plant wild flowers I I love the whole thing about no mo may where you just let your garden just grow. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, and I've got to say, we did it this year, we did it last year. And the butterflies that I've had here, and said, I'm in a little town. It's not like I'm in the middle of nowhere. Um, And then people have had loads more butterflies this year. So it works. You know what I mean? This is like two years down the line, but all, you know, all the, it is beautiful to see. It's just wonderful. It's just lovely. It's, um, there's, there is something in us that loves that wildness I think we don't like to be constrained as human. We don't like to be put in boxes and cages. And I think seeing that wildness in nature um, and rewilding as well, of course, is a really, really important thing um, rather than having this sort of like intensive farming with, with animals. I mean, what are we doing? Putting pigs in cages and leaving and chaining them down to, on their side so that they give birth over and over again and they can't run around and, you know, they get sores on their side. And what are, what are we doing? Yeah. We're mad. This Madness. is crazy. Totally crazy. Let's have some rewilding. Let's have urban farms. Let's so we can reconnect with where our food comes from. It's going to reduce food miles. It's going to have us, you know, so we so we consume things in a different way. We don't just think we can, oh, it's it's gone off, or we'll just go to the shop and yeah. get some more. Yeah. Actually, it's no, well, let's eat seasonally. 
they, you know, another thing that I'm really interested in is that you, know, you can put solar panels on a roof, which is great because that's we you know we need that with this green energy most definitely. Please, no nuclear power. I'm not. I no no. What what are they thinking? What are they thinking? Um, but you know, we can put we can put these solar panels on the roof, and then we can put plants underneath them. Yeah. Um, particularly if it's going to get hotter. <clears throat> excuse me. The plants, the uh, solar panels will add, will collect and collect rainwater. You know, we can have uh, water yeah. bugs around it. You know, we can do that. We can actually have that rainwater um, f- water the plants. Um, it can be a place of haven. People can go upstairs and, you know, up on the roof. And you can have beehives on the roof. And, and it's important not to just have it as a silo. If you can try and get all the roofs, you know, even if you're in a residential area or if you're if you're in a city, I mean, even better because you're bringing it in. But if you can get lots of roof gardens, then you've got places for the bees to go to and the birds to stop off and roost and nest. And, and then it becomes like a wildlife corridor on the on the roofs. And talking of wildlife corridors, I, I bet you didn't. I bet you wish you hadn't asked me now. <laughs> um, I'm loving this. But, yeah, but, um, but to have wildlife corridors going through cities and towns yeah. and uh, I mean, just fantastic so that um wildlife can get from a to b i mean we do it we kind of and we wonder why there's so much roadkill on the roads we put these yeah. these great big you know motorways or a roads or whatever they are you know they cut through natural you know the, these this woodlands and because the animals are going well my house is over there and they're trying to get from a to b and they've got nowhere to go so we need to create these corridors either underneath the roads or above mm. the roads i mean i've seen them with bridges where the where the cor- oh, you know yeah. they can walk across um it's it's brilliant we, we, and then those places those those corridors will be used by communities by families so then it, it makes it safer as well so there's all this added benefit of creating you know add you know safer environments for people to cycle because people also go oh well, I don't want to cycle because mm. I might get you know might get attacked someone might nick my bike um or you know might nick my computer that's in my backpack or whatever but if there's more people out on the road more people looking out for each other and and I have to say I think people are kinder than we think they are. I think there are, you know what I mean? I think people are not as horrible as as we're kind of tried to, we're, we're led to believe if we listen to all the media and listen mm. to the news stories and all the soap operas and everything else. There's a lot of negativity. And I think by surrounding ourselves again with nature um, in the built environment, I think we'll be more understanding, more trusting, and the and the and the world will be a, a more peaceful place. There's a lot more I could say, but I think that's probably enough, isn't it? <laughs> I think I think the sort of um, you're right about the sort of social connection aspect, and I find that living in London, if a stranger approaches me and talks to me, I'm very cagey, and I've sort of <laughs> learned that behavior in London. That like you know, I, mm. d- I don't open myself immediately to people. I sort of think like, what do you want? I know you're. I'm sure you're up to something. And it's that sort of <laughs> is that sort of density of people that makes you feel like okay, I can't interact with everyone. There's just too much going on. I have to sort of you know mm. ignore people to an extent um, and sort of be a bit suspicious. But when I'm back in in Galway, where I'm from, um, in in the West of Ireland, much smaller place, um, much more biophilic place in many ways. Um, I I you know it's I love all those interactions with people. Um, I'm you know and something clicks in me that tells me like this is this is perfectly fine. This is safe. You know, I feel comfortable with this. And you can have yeah. those conversations with people without thinking, you know, without being sort of suspicious and being a bit antisocial <laughs> about it. So I mean, there's yeah. definitely something to that, you know? Yeah, exactly. And if you said like going back to Galway, I mean, it's beautiful and green there. Oh my word. My, my family's County Clare. So, really. but yeah, just, <laughs> so you've got like, you know, but the beauty, the beauty of it, the greenery around us, it kind of, it's just our mindset is different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're we're slower, we're calmer. And you just mentioned actually the word denser. The more people we've got in us in a tiny environment, the you know, we are. We and the noise factor as well. Yeah. Um, like you said, it be you know, we 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 we're more aggressive. So actually if we can spread that, spread people around, take them down different paths with trees and mm. intersperse them so that they have different things to think about and to focus on, um, and to be in a softer um more feminine if you want environment you know it will just make it more you know we'll just we'll behave differently yeah. we'll, we'll behave differently and then i mean i'm just going to say actually if you think about it in, when you're in a london park i mean I, I did a i was at a conference a, a few months ago and um stayed over and I, I came out the next morning and i walked through um uh a, a high park and it was just and then people were talking. It was one of those sort of early winter days where it was just, you know, sort of, it was just lovely. It was warm, and people started were talking and chatting, and there was laughter. And it, and it is you just you just behave differently. You just behave differently yeah. when 
you're sur- when you're with when you're surrounded by beauty and awe. That's another mm-hmm. thing about biophilic design that I just go on about all the time. We need more awe in our lives. We need those moments where our jaws drop and go, yeah. oh, my word, that's beautiful. Like the Singapore airport, like when we're on the top of a mountain, yeah. like when we're surrounded in a forest, like when we're collecting tiny, tiny mushrooms. And you're like, wow, look at those. Look at, you know, all the veins and things on that mushroom. And we just there are so many moments of awe that just stop us in our tracks and refigure our brains and gives us some time out to make us more mindful um, and, you know, more patient with each other and with ourselves as well, you know, so um, all these different aspects help our well-being and our flourishing. <laughs> yeah. I think a big, a big challenge for um, designers, architects, planners right now is in designing density and higher mm. density that yeah. is uh, that is not overcrowded and is not stressful um, yeah. and that allows people to live a sort of calm life where they can have good social interactions, have privacy, um, have a good environment. But still, I, I suppose the, the benefit of density is that if you can fit more people, you know, on a, a piece of land, it means the rest of the land can remain as wild land or, or natural land and, and can be undeveloped. Uh, in that sense and also means you can you get the benefits of having public transport being able to walk and cycle places whereas if we're all spread out um, everyone has to jump in a car to drive around basically so I think there is a real challenge of getting the benefit of of you know maybe like country living or village living where you have a lot more space a lot slower pace of life but somehow doing that in an urban environment where you sort of by default need to have that critical mass of people there to make it work um, well, actually- and- yeah. Go ahead. I'm just yeah. going to say, I'm just about to say, I, actually, I've been reading a really interesting book. Um, it's by Christopher Alexander, A Pattern Language. Oh, yeah. It was, have you read it? Oh, have, my word. Not since university. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah. I, I hadn't come across it before. And, and again, yeah. Dr. Sally Augustine was mentioning it to me. She's going, oh, you know, this is like a definitive book. But he talks about how our density of cities, and instead of having like this massive city, let's have a, like, let's have a smaller city, but have little towns around it mm. and in between um there's like i go on about wildlife corridors but they're farming corridors mm. so we're all producing food that's like local to us um and you know that reduce the re- that would reduce the um the uh the, the density yeah um and yeah and anyway we could also talk about overpopulation but we won't <laughs> <laughs> well i think that actually you reminded me about food growing as well and i think that's another thing that could be yeah. that ticks loads of boxes because, um, you know, people always report, you know, a lot of people say, oh, gardening is my happy place, you know, or like I love when I'm stressed, I go to my allotment and I that yeah. just, you know, makes me feel right with the world again. And um, I think what you what a lot of people find is once they have a decent sort of growing space, you know, not too much, but like more than a windowsill or more than like a little back garden, you, you end up producing way more food than you can actually you can actually yeah. eat yourself or as one family or one person. And so you end up sort of giving it away to people in your community. Yeah. And it's this amazing thing that connects connects communities together. So you have a little community in the allotment and you swap things. You end up going over to your neighbors with a box of apples and say, I don't know what to do with them, you have them. And yeah. I think that's a really, really wonderful thing that as you said, when food comes from the supermarket, we don't respect it, but we also don't get all the other incidental benefits from it as well. So, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely. And you know what? Like um, allotments always have a waiting list in in cities. You know, they're very it's very hard to get one because they're so popular. So why aren't why aren't we making more of them? You know, that's the big question. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, To to bring us on to I mean, I've been loving this conversation. I could keep going all day, but I'll I'll bring us on to our sort of final question. Um, I always ask guests. Um, and this, this question has changed a little bit because when I started the podcast in 2020, I used to say we're at the beginning of a decade of action in terms of, of climate change. The 2020s up to 2030 is sort of this critical decade for taking action. But we're now two years in to that critical decade. And so now I have to ask people, you know, what do we need to do in the next eight years <laughs> to, to ensure successful action on climate change or, or sort of thinking about that 2030 uh, deadline? What does that mean for you, I guess? Well, um, I think, and I was thinking about this, I think it's it comes down, I think we've all got a place, you know, we've all got a something to play, I think. Mm. We've all got a part to play in this whole bigger picture. And I think 
the more of us that can do something is better than just relying on the government and the people at the top to do something. Because, you know, they might do something, but actually, um, you know, change starts with us. Change starts with me, starts with you. Um, and what, you know, what you're doing, creating this podcast is, you know, is getting people talking and thinking and questioning and then action and then action. So it's not just about um, coming up with a kind of like, oh, this could work, that could work. It's actually just give it a go. Let's try the urban farming, the community farming. Um, just what can we do? What can you do in your backyard when I spoke to Chris Packham and he said, you know, just plant native species, plant farms, put a pond in. What can you do? What can you do? Do something, do something, because then you'll talk about it because yeah. you're just like, oh, my goodness, I've just grown some little peas and I've and I've grown them from seed and it's amazing. And people go, oh, I haven't done that for ages. I'll never go at that. Um, you know, if you've got kids, do it with the children, do it with your mates, go and get a bottle of wine and, you know, <laughs> go and go and plant something together, plant some trees, um, get the get the dialogue going. But I think for me, the change, I think what really needs to happen now and I think is happening. Um, and the more people that I'm speaking to personally, I think more and more people are passionate about it, feeling it from their heart and actually doing something. Mm. Um, and I think people like to be part of something that is successful rather than being the first or then being something that's going to like that's going to fall apart because you think, well, what's the point? Because there's no yeah. point in doing anything, I think. For me, it's about positive messaging. It's about saying, look, look at all these good things that are happening. Look at the new design. Look at the new community spaces. Look at the bee, bees on roofs. Look at the, you know, how the wildflower meadows are actually coming back. Look at all these community fantastic things. Look at incredible edible, to, you know, yeah. look at look at all these, the bus, you know, what, let's, 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 let's do stuff. And if you don't know, these are the places you can find out. Start a dialogue, ask people. Um, you know, join the Wildlife Trust. Go, go and go to the, around the local, um, you know, canals and and seeing what you can see. Become a photographer. See what you, you know, document stuff. Post it on Instagram. You know, share the love, share the knowledge, and share that enthusiasm for our natural world and and for um, and for all the successes that people are doing within the community, um, in cities, in towns, in villages, um, and within homes and within families as well. I think. Um, and, and across the water, I think we can learn a lot from each other. Yeah. So I think what could be happen over the next few years, I think over the next year, it would be nice to see like this crazy acceleration of everybody just enthusing about it because then, you know, people in charge are part of those communities as well. And if they're being pressured or, or kind of, you know, their family members are going, oh, you know, did you know that this is happening down the road or this has happened in that village, they might it might trigger something within them to make a policy change, to do something different, to vote differently. Mm. Um, and that's something we can, we, us as individuals can vote for the people who are doing the things yeah. that we want them to do. Um, unfortunately, some of them do say they're going to do something and then go and do something else <laughs> afterwards. Um, but, you know, maybe maybe you are that sort of person that kind of want to stand up and stand for something. Then maybe you stand stand for government, stand for your local councillor, you know, do it, do it, just do it do it do something <laughs> I, yeah. I love that that's fantastic and i think you're you're absolutely right there's there's a quote from uh rob hopkins he has a great book um he has several really good books actually but something uh, a quote that i always come back to is he says if we act if we act as individuals it will be too little if we wait for government it'll be too late but if we act as communities it might be just enough and it might be just in time and I find that really, really inspiring. So that's sort of power of, of local communities coming together and, and, and just doing stuff. Um, great, a great point to end on. Is there, um, where can people find more about you and about the work you're doing? Um, well, if they go to the journal of biophilic design.com. We're also on Twitter and LinkedIn and everything else. So please connect with me with LinkedIn um, on uh, Vanessa Champion. Um, but yeah, but please go to the journal of biophilic design.com, sign up for the newsletter. Um, I say we're launching a, a magazine um, in October this year. Um, and um, yeah, I encourage people to subscribe. Um, if they want to submit articles or write or whatever, then just get involved. You know, it's, it's there as a platform to share the love if you want and share inspiration for, for biophilic design and a, and a better way of being. So yeah, so that, that's, that's kind of where you can find me. <laughs> 